Hello and good evening, everybody. Thanks a lot for coming to Exploratorium tonight. My name is Matthias Maschat. Um, here at Exploratorium, I'm responsible for our Denkraum Improvisation, our thinking space, uh, where we are <coughs> thinking about improvisation, as the same name says. Uh, this is uh, the last event that I am hosting in the rooms here in uh, Meringdam before we will move to a new venue, uh, as you might know. Um, and for this occasion, I'm really happy uh, to have a fantastic trio as a guest, Colophony. And um, the series is entitled Sound and Lecture today, and we are going to take the, the series. <laughs> so. Usually it's a, a talk and a concert, but today, indeed, we are going to have two short lectures. Uh, John Rose is going to start uh, to talk about his work, then Richard Barrett is going to talk about his work, and afterwards we are going to have a, a Q&A, a discussion, so maybe everything that comes into your mind that you would like to ask, uh, keep it, and then after the two lectures uh, we can uh, talk with John and Richard. Uh, they both have met in the 90s in Amsterdam at Stein, and so since there is so much to talk about, uh, we decided to focus on, on this a little bit uh, because there are several connections between uh, their work uh, which are worth talking about, definitely. Afterwards, uh, we'll have a short break, and uh, you can have drinks here. Um, please just put the money for the drinks in the, uh, in the casa. Um, what else is there to say? Colophony uh, is John Rose, Richard Barrett, and also double bass player Meinrad Kneer. I'm really happy that you are all here, and then we can start with you, John. Okay. And enjoy. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, good Abend, vielen Dank. Uh, dass die hier gekommen sind. Es ist äh, lange her, als ich schlecht Deutsch gesprochen habe. So, auf Englisch gehen wir weiter. Um, this is, by the way, not amplifying. This is for the internet uh, netcast. So, I'm just going to do two things in a short space of time. One is why I got into improvisation. Um, and the other is the, the connection that I have with Richard with interactive technology and how that can be applied <coughs> to instrumental music and particularly to improvisation. So how I got into it? Well, I started the violin at seven. I won a music scholarship uh, to a, a stupid school where I studied music and uh, voice and violin and everything was going along just fine. I did my Brahms, Beethoven, and Bach, and uh, around about the age of 14, I suddenly realized there was other kinds of music in the world of, of which I was not playing, and more to the point, I couldn't play. And so at the age of 15, I gave up playing the violin. I would have to hasten to say that fifth, when I was 15, it was 1966, which is a long time ago. Um, but I thought there was something inherently wrong with the instrument. I could only play from Noten, and um, I couldn't do anything else with it. But I was very, and being the 60s, of course, it was very easy to pick up the guitar and strum away and play Bob Dylan imitations and attract women. In my case, that was an important thing, I remember. Um, and the first improvising instrument I played was actually a double bass, because the school had a bass, but no one to play it and uh, there was a jazz group and the uh, the piano player very kindly showed me a few licks on the bass and i thought well, this is another way of doing music there's no notation i'm just playing by ear so that's how i got into playing improvisation was on other instruments i could do nothing on the violin furthermore the models on the violin which were basically jazz as something to do with improvisation i found completely cheesy I mean, I love jazz, but like um, Stuff Smith would be the first kind of person I listened to, but he was probably the best. But people like Stefan Grappelli to me just sounded nothing going on, nothing that attracted me. So then I took up the violin again when I was 20, 
and I decided to teach myself from the beginning. You have to remember that back then there were no books, no self-help books, no play-along records, no, none of this existed. So um, I, uh, I literally taught myself, excuse the pun, from scratch. So I cov the first thing I did was cover the strings with tape and just work with the bow. Because the music I liked had rhythm, and I'd, my whole violin education was, was about how not to have rhythm in the bow, how to have a bow that never ended. It's the opposite. So I just taught myself, almost like a drummer, like how to play. You'll hear a bit of that maybe later, maybe not. Um, and, um, and so that's how I started out and slowly developed. Now, between that and the, my next subject, there's a lot that happened, including one thing that diff makes me very different probably to just about every person who ever improvised on the violin is that I build instruments too. I also hack into violins. I have had violins that are played by the wind, um, by wheels, by water. I've joined them together like Siamese twins. I've done all these kinds of experiments. Whatever f fantasy I had in my head and I could build it, I've, I've built it. Um, and but in the early 80s, as the digital world slowly started to become available, um, I thought, well, this is here and now, and the violin has to go somewhere. Like up to that point, I've also taken the violin to many areas where it doesn't normally go, like supermarkets, middle of freeways, uh, oceans, deserts. So I thought, the digital world is coming, the violin's got to go there. How am I going to deal with this? And so I, um, I was aware of people like George Lewis uh, who were, were working with making interactive systems for instrumentalists to play with. But most of it was to do with what we call um, pitch to MIDI uh, systems, whereby there's a pitch and that becomes formulated into MIDI and that becomes sort of some kind of sound, whatever you want to make with it. Um, somehow this didn't appeal to me. I wanted something that was something that was about the business of playing the violin. And to put it simply, the business of playing the violin is that the bow is the engine. It's the power. It drives the thing. And this is the manipulator. I mean, there are other things that go on too, agreed. But these were the two things. I thought, I want this, the thing that powers the violin to also power this interactive technology, which I'm entering. So I have no interest in changing the sound of the violin. You know, if I want to have another instrument, I'll build one. But the violin is what it is. What was important was how to get it into this area. And so I, uh, this is where I met Richard. Stein was one of the few institutes in the world, I'm probably the only one in Europe, there were a few in the States, but um, where they were interested in trying to develop a a method for musicians who weren't necessarily computer geeks, but who were interested in the technology, how to get them involved and how to make this, how to make the, uh, uh, how to have an interface with this technology other than sit there and press a button. And so I tried this with the bow and up on the screen, the top right, yeah, that's Mark III. So I've already had made two uh, with help from people in Stein. As you see, they're very primitive affairs. <laughs> um, we tried all kinds of things to get this bow, like to get da data from a bow. The first thing we put on actually was um, a shopping code. So when you, you know, when you check out at the shop, you run your thing past the code. Well, we tried shopping code, but that seems kind of limited and also only one directional. So what I put in this bow here was actually a sensor from an electronic keyboard, a DX7, which had pressure control. And I got quite a good signal. And then these little switches up on the right, they were basically uh, what, what I would call mapping signals. And the whole thing about Stein back then, um, and I don't know why, but nobody ever considered that there should be a visual interface to anything that was going on. So I would, I, I would be pressing these things, uh, these, these switches, and I'd be playing, and I basically had to learn an entire 
interactive system in the same way that you would uh, learn the violin. I mean, hell, there are no notes on the violin, right? Like, you've got to figure out. And it was a bit like that. There, there, were no, there were no visual things telling me this is A33 or whatever. There was nothing going on. It was just what you were hearing and you had to react to it. And the first systems that I built with this were, when I think about it, completely crazy because I had um, the, the, the mapping tables didn't go chronologically. They were designed to go using basically a, a chaotic system. So I had no idea what was going to ha come. And by playing, if you think about it, by playing the violin, I changed what happened. And if I, by hearing what had just happened, I react to it, I've changed it again. So it was an impossible, it was like being thrown into a swimming pool and you can't swim. You're just thrashing around and trying to get this thing to, to work. And that's basically how I, how, how I brought it in. It was exhausting. I mean, uh, uh, this was early, just say, with pressure sensors and stuff. And then eventually I added accelerometers. And these are the things that are in aeroplanes. Well, actually, they're in phones. They're in everything now. But then they weren't. They were very expensive. Um, and so the movement of the bow could add material to this, and, and, and then on it went. Anyway, I'm going to play you a couple of things that, that I did back then, which seems an awful lot. I just looked at the date today when I put this up on the screen. That is 30 years ago. It's unbelievable. Anyway, um, so the first thing I'm going to play you is me just playing the violin with, I think it's Mark III. It might have even been Mark II. And... What I was aware of with digital technology, it's very easy to have a lot of stuff. And, and, it's, and it's very hard to make pertinent, pertinent stuff limited. And my, my view, and it still it remains today, that to have expression in music, there must be limits. If there's no limits, there's no expression. So this first piece you're going to hear, there is just one MIDI channel's worth of material driving a very primitive K1, a car wire synthesizer. So everything you hear is just, is just one stream of information from the bow. And the rest is an acoustic violin. And as you hear, it's, it's very busy. I hope it doesn't shock anybody. It's a bit early in the night for this. But. <laughs> before everybody has to leave the room. Um, so you could also kid the computer, which appealed to me. So like if you play very lightly, of course, you're not sending a massive signal. You can spend, you know, so you could actually fool the computer. So that appealed to me too. Um, this, at the same time I was working with this, I also realized that the bow, this engine thing, of course, had its own sound. Most people, when you go and listen to a violinist in a concert hall, you just hear the violin, you think. But in fact, there's an awful lot of noise being generated by the bow itself. And so I amplified a bow, and I, and I then used another bow to play the bow. So I had two bows. I had the bow, which was amplified, and then I played that bow with the interactive bow. And um, I'll play you a little bit of that. It sounds also kind of crazy, but it's just the sound of a violin bow. <laughs>
That's not strictly true. I remember there was a, I put a string on that one too. So there's a, anyway. <laughs> Um, West Coast kind of cowboy, entrepreneur, interactive kind of guy. And he'd built this bow, which was, if my stuff was insane, this was completely ridiculous. The K-bow. And there's some pictures of this thing. And he, I don't think there's any room in there for any, literally anything at all. And it had like seven lots of, uh, of interactive capacity on it, including accelerometers, but also this was um, fiberglass, the actual bow, so there was an aerial inside. So there was all these different controllers. I mean, extre extremely complicated thing. Anyway, I sort of put my hand up to almost be the guinea pig for this thing. There were other violinists that tried it, but it's like, to make this thing make sense over a period of a 45-minute concert was a lot of work. And, um, and it did, and sometimes it didn't work, and, and sometimes it did. And um, I basically don't play it anymore because he doesn't support it anymore, because he is American, and he just needs to make money, and he realized that this was a wonderful piece of technology wasn't ever going to make him any money, particularly from violinists who would be terrified of this thing, especially like the look of it, everything about it. And that's where I'm going to stop because these have got to be short and we're going to hand you over now to Richard Barrett uh, who will take you on further in this little chit-chat about... Uh, I mean, we can do questions at the end if there are any. Uh, is that right, Matthias? Yeah, okay, all good. Thank you. Oh, hello. Uh, um, I'm going to talk behind this microphone. And I look as if I'm going to be a lounge singer now, don't I? But I'm, I'm not going to do that. You will all be pleased to hear. Um, and um, just to make sure that... Uh, Everything is working here. Yeah, so um, I have a rather um, different angle on, uh, on what we're doing tonight from John, although as, as he mentioned, um, we first came across each other at Stein in Amsterdam in the mid-1990s, and that was quite an important time for me as well. Um, I wasn't concerned with, uh, with violin bows or anything like that, but um, it's important to remember that uh, Stein stands in Dutch for Studio for Electro-Instrumental Music. And as John has already said, that was a fairly um, unique thing to exist at that time. That is to say, um, an electronic music studio which was dedicated to the not producing um, multi-channel electronic compositions which would be played back in concerts and things like that. But my voice is almost gone. I can't, I can't do much more than this. <clears throat> Sorry. I'll try and speak a bit louder, but my, my voice might disappear altogether if I do that. I'm trying to talk to the microphone. Um, and uh, it, it, it was a fairly unique place um, in terms of you know, not working on what by that time already were traditional forms of electronic composition, which would, be, which would exist on tape or later on CDs or other, other forms of digital storage but to create um, instruments for people to perform with. And um, it's always seemed to me that once we get into the area of... Um, oh, thanks, that's even better. Um, once we get into the area of um, using this digital technology um, to construct musical instruments, then it almost goes without saying that improvised music is the most appropriate way to take that technology. Why is that? Because we're faced, well, there are various reasons, but the, the, the one which um, appeals to me most is that um, we are faced with an almost infinite variety of, uh, of possibilities when we're playing electronic instruments. I'll come back to that a little bit later. 
And <clears throat> how do we make a choice within this vast ocean of possibilities to um, take a particular direction? And one of the ways in which we can make that choice is to be involved in a freely improvised music where we have to make that choice right now. So that means, even if it's random, even if it's like um, dropping a pin on a map somewhere and then going to that place, um, as our training as improvising musicians mean that we have to make something out of that moment, we have to use that as our material. Um, and that's, um, that's an input which goes into the way that we choose to use those instruments. And this is something I find quite fascinating. And it's something that was very much encouraged um, at Stein when John and I were working there in the mid-90s. Um, that is to um, develop instruments which had certain kinds of instability built into them. So it wasn't always possible or desirable to know exactly what sound was going to come out when you play an instrument. But to be able to reach out into this um, infinite range of possibilities and then to be able to sculpt it in some sort of way in real time. So what the um, listener hears when this music is going on is a process by which sound is being explored. And as a listener, I find that very exciting. And um, that, of course, then influenced the way that I thought about making music myself. Um, <clears throat> now, anybody who knows anything about the work that I do will know that alongside um, improvised music, I'm also working on quite intricately notated compositions. And um, I think it's worth saying something about that because um, it might seem to be a contradiction somehow. Um, and it did seem like a contradiction to me for, for some time until I made the realization that actually composition is what we're doing all the time when we're creating music. So I think of the word composition as meaning musical creation in all its forms and improvisation as a way of doing that which involves spontaneity, which involves spontaneous actions and reactions, not just reactions to the instrument, as I um, mentioned, but also reactions to one's, one's fellow performers. And once I made that realization, it became possible then to imagine all kinds of different ways of um, um, negotiating the spectrum between the reflective and the spontaneous in music making. And in fact, um, when we're playing free improvisation, of course, we don't um, come into the, uh, the concert hall knowing nothing about what we're doing. Um, John is a trained violinist, obviously. I'm not really a trained performer, but I've been working with this kind of technology for long enough that I bring with me a certain set of skills, preferences, ideas, um, which the, the, the skill of an improviser, if you like, is the consistent the ability to be able to negotiate through that landscape in, in a spontaneous and meaningful way um, in relation to what else is going on in the music. But at the same time, um, I'm interested in looking at the, um, the, the, the role that um, reflective composition can play in that process. Um, not necessarily at the moment when one is playing the music, but at, at, at other moments, in terms of um, making an instrument like this, is also an act of composition. Um, and it also involves spontaneous um, decision-making at some point. So it's a little bit like um, if you imagine making a film where, first of all, you have, as a director, you have the actors um, <clears throat> improvise on the set, um, and you're creating large amounts of footage which are then edited into the film, but there can also be improvisation in the editing room because one can work sufficiently quickly to, to be able to react spontaneously to the material that one has. So throughout the process of um, filmmaking, there is a kind of um, uh, alternation between more reflective and more um, spontaneous creative actions. And um, I think it's important to, for myself anyway, to, to look at how um, 
other art forms like film, like dance, like visual art and so on, talk about improvisation because one of the problems with talking about improvisation with music is that we're often um, using a vocabulary which was developed in order to talk about music which is written on paper and which um, regards improvisation as a somehow inferior form of music making because it's not contained in that um, uh, timeless um, preserved form, the canon of classical music and so on. Um, and I found it very um, uh, inspiring actually over the last few years um, to, to think about how um, dancers, filmmakers and so forth talk about improvisation in their art and looking at how that relates to, um, again, this relationship between <coughs> reflective and spontaneous work in music. And I want to say one more thing about that, which is that, um, of course, as, as a composer, I'm aware of a history going back to the early 1960s of um, composers of notated music gradually getting more and more involved in um, ways of making music which involve improvisation in different ways. And um, very often this would take the form of using the um, notated score as a model and opening up space in that score for improvisation to take place. And it's always struck me that that's a rather one-sided way of looking at this relationship. And I've always wanted to look at it the other way around, which is to say that free improvisation is the fundamental model. And what um, composition does, what notated composition might do, is to provide um, different kinds of structural or poetic points of focus within that uh, um, improvisational um, atmosphere or matrix or whatever you want to call it. And this has been um, a very important um, influence. This thought has been a very important influence, not just on the work that I do with um, notated composition, but in improvisation too. And one more thing I want to say is the, the way that this um, works itself into the instrument that you're going to hear me playing this evening which is something that, um, like John's work, has been in development for a very long time now. And it's like the human body in that the actual physical components that it consists of are completely different from the ones that I started off with. But somehow the, um, the identity of the instrument is found in a particular um, um, way of relating physically as a performer to the sounds that the instrument produces. And um, something that we saw on the screen that, uh, that John showed us before, which he didn't go into so much, was that he was using um, a software application developed at STIME in the 1990s called LISA. Um, and LISA stood for Live Sampling. And it was a program which was created for the late Michel Weisswiss um, as a means of um, recording and playing back material in real time using various different kinds of interface. Michel had an instrument he called the hands, which was um, what would now be called a pair of data gloves whose orientation and movement in different um, uh, dimensions could be used to control different aspects of the, of the music. And I found this, um, this software very um, attractive indeed to work with, but not in any way to do with its live sampling capabilities. But because um, the way that it works um, is that you record a stretch of music and then you're able to access that in different ways and sculpt it into different shapes. Um, play it forwards, play it backwards, play it at different pitches and much less obvious things than that as well. Um, but for me that gave me an opportunity then to um, think about how to compose the instrument that I'm playing in terms of the sound that it makes. So what I've done over the period since I started using this, which I think was in 1997, is developed a whole um, repertoire of sound materials which are, to a certain extent, composed, um, but which then form the um, architectural components which go into making the instrument. So um, every time I'm playing, I have a five-minute um, stretch of sound material in the instrument. Some of these are collages consisting of hundreds of different kinds of sound. 
and others are, for example, a single sound which gradually evolves over the five minutes. But of course, I don't have to take five minutes to play it back. I can rush through it forwards, or I can go backwards, or I can pick any point within it so that I can turn that gradual change into something more discontinuous. And the same with the collages of hundreds of small sounds. Those can um, conversely be, be spread out in time and turned into completely different shapes. So by <clears throat> starting from any of these standpoints, starting points, these materials, these compositional materials, they can be shaped in the real time of improvisational performance into um, all kinds of, of uh, different forms which means then that, that the instrument can be very responsive to, um, to the playing techniques that I've developed for it. Um, and the last thing I'm going to say is just talking about playing techniques for a while. That if you look at the instrument here, you'll see that the thing that's closest to me here is a... Well, I won't lift it up now because something's bound to go wrong if I do. But, um, but there's a keyboard here with traditional keys on it. Um, <clears throat> and I haven't... Um, I haven't decided to use the keyboard as a default. I'm not a keyboard player, and I've, it's not because I've not um, thought about the alternatives, but because I actually have thought of, of many of the alternatives, and I've ended up with this thing here, which is, a, of course, a set of um, switches, or as Cecil Taylor would have said, a set of drums um, whose position in space I'm very familiar with. But there the resemblance ends, because... <clears throat> In order to fit as many sounds as possible onto a single keyboard, um, what I've done is I've linked the parameter of key velocity, so how hard I hit the key, with the um, pitch height of the sound that comes out. So if I hit the key harder, it doesn't get louder because loudness is controlled by a volume pedal, um, but um, it gets higher in pitch. And that might be something microtonal, so I can make um, very fine distinctions in pitch, or I might set the pitch bend range to be six octaves. So then the actual pitch that comes out when I play is more or less beyond my control, except obviously I've trained myself to be able to, um, to do this to, to some extent. Um, but um, one of the things that I like about the, the instrument as it's developed, as it has been composed, is the idea of being able to um, drop this random pin in the map and then look around and see where I am. So the instabilities that are built into an instrument like the violin, because it's made of wood and string and horsehair and all that stuff, have to be programmed in to an electronic instrument. Those things which are um, controllably unstable, so that sometimes I can know exactly what's, what the instrument is going to produce, whereas at other times I might not want to have very much control over that at all. So um, that's a compositional act as well. That's a, that's a um, compositionally creative idea, which is to think of an instrument as this kind of field of possibilities with various degrees of um, randomness about it, because that's one of the things that I find most attractive in the way that um, acoustic instrumentalists work. So there is something which is perhaps a little traditional about the way that I conceive of an instrument because um, what I want to be able to do is what John and Meinrad, Meinrad can do with their instruments. I want to be as fluent with my instrument as they are with theirs. I'm not trying to put this instrument into a different world where those um, kinds of actions and reactions and interrelationships no longer have any meaning, although I could do that. Um, but everything that I've done in composing the instrument has been in the direction of trying to compose um, with the physicality of, of interacting with, uh, with these sounds. I think that's what I have to say. Thanks. <laughs> All right, thank you so much for this insight that you gave. Uh, it's really exciting uh, to really hear something about how the music is made also. I'm 
not very much into technical things at all. And so I'm rather coming to concerts as a listener. And it's always really interesting to hear all these thoughts that are on, on the background of music. And um, I think here we have also the cases of um, that, that this is something really individual. You're, you have been working on stuff that makes it totally unique, your, your access in the end uh, to improvisation. Um, in the beginning, I also wanted to say that uh, you have also written about music. And um, your book was Music of Possibility. And now we've heard a lot of, about the possibilities and also about the dialectics uh, between possibility and limitations also. I'm really fascinated by this, um, because if I can say this uh, personal aspect maybe, um, the aspect of possibility <coughs> is something which totally fascinates me on improvisation actually. Um, that you don't know what is going to happen everything is possible and then of course through means of limitations also uh, it, it is happening what is happening that's really great and that's also another book coming up very soon Richard has told me um, it will be uh, it's focusing a lot about improvisation and John was also so, so kind to bring his uh, four books uh, we'll have them all here in the library. So if you are interested to read more about it, um, it's, it's a lot about everything he's done with the violin and so on. Um, so maybe if there are questions from the audience, we can just start right now there. You didn't collect all the... <laughs> Okay. Uh, okay, question. Um, Richard, you talked about instability of like acoustic instruments, and then you used the word random and it, random is a word that I've often heard in, in the context of it, uh, especially in the context of electronic music when, when discussing improvisation. But is random, is that, is that the right word in discussing the instability of acoustic instruments? Um, well, I suppose one possible answer to that is, is to say that um, the instabilities of acoustic instruments are built into the physical materials that the instruments are made of, um, whereas those instabilities in a digital instrument um, need to be put there by means of some degree of randomization of the parameters that you're working with. So you're right, um, random doesn't apply to, to what happens to pieces of wood and strings, but in order to kind of emulate that um, that kind of instability, then um, yeah, the, the means of doing that with computer programming is by incorporating randomness. And I, I have an example which um, you've probably um, experienced yourself before, um, <clears throat> because uh, this is Hannah Old Park, whom I've played with on a number of occasions. Um, and we, we have a very close-knit uh, improvising duo together where um, it has a lot to do with instability as well, I guess, right? Um, but there was, there was one um, occasion um, in 2001 when, <clears throat> when I was about to go into the studio to um, make some duo recordings with the saxophone player Evan Parker, who's probably familiar to everybody in this room. And um, one of the things I wanted to be able to do in, in that uh, context was to use some um, recorded material of Evan's soprano playing in the computer to make a kind of parallel version of what he would play. Um, and um, I can't just play back what, what Evan played. Um, obviously, that, that would be a silly and pointless thing to do. Um, but um, what I did want to do was to try and um, create a sort of parallel instability to the way that when he's playing his solo soprano music, um, it's always repeating itself but never quite the same. 
And that's something which is to do with the instabilities that are produced by using the two hands as um, independent uh, entities in the playing and the embouchure of the mouth as, as another independent entity. So those things together produce instability. And so in order to make something that sounded um, as if it could move in that same direction, what I did was um, I took some recordings of Evans playing and instead of looping them on themselves in um, the familiar way that, that we know from electronic dance music and things like that, where a sound repeats itself precisely. The starting point of the loop and the length of the loop could be changed very rapidly and randomly. And once I did that, um, I could make something which sounded a little bit more like what he would actually play, how, how the instabilities of, those instrument, of that instrument and the way he plays it would produce their result. And that was done by programming various controllably random functions into the, into the software uh, I was using. Just to add to that, there is also, random is a, is, a <clears throat> is a meaningless term because if you program it, by definition, it's no longer random. So you might use a waveform that's random, but you've already programmed it. I mean, random as we understand it is when some lunatic jumps off the street and pulls the power out. That's random. But random in computer music is a very defined term, like you set a thing that looks sort of random, but it's not. It's just it's, it's a, another waveform, in the same way that there's a logarithmic waveform or other kinds of waveforms. So there's a problem there with language. I don't know if you agree with that, but anyway. It's like <coughs> what <coughs> random doesn't really mean what, what a random event... Well I think this is a really interesting yeah. issue, actually, because not to do with mathematics or yeah. computer programming generally, but, but if, if we think of something like um, a Zen garden, for instance, um, what we're supposed to experience there is, um, I think, um, a situation where the position of the objects in the garden um, looks as if there was no human agency behind it. It looks random. But what we experience as random and what actually is random are two quite different things, right? This is, mm -hmm. this is yeah. My, yeah. the point of agreement here. If we want something that sounds um, as if anything is possible at any time, that is to say, random within the, um, what's, uh, the, within the um, informal use of the word, then actually <laughs> we need to think very carefully about how to do it. Yeah. Um, and we have to be very careful about where those rocks are placed. Because if they were random, a random input into the position of the rocks could place them all in a straight line. And we wouldn't experience mm. that as random, but it would have been random. In fact. But a meteorite landing right on top of that yeah. is random. That's a random that's, event. Yeah. That's random. Well, although, that's caused by something as well. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> Maybe we should move away from this. Yeah, I think we Uh, you said that um, kind of the, the composed and notated music is um, an exception, no? It's culturally and historically the exception, and not improvisation is the exception. If you look into music in a wider range, and um, um, I think it's clear why that happened. It's because of music theory, because of the development of the uh, society in the last centuries. But um, what do you think about could happen in uh, improvisation? I see there is, in the last year, there has been a very important change because there is an increasing uh, <coughs> level of theory, there is an increasing level of research um, in improvisation. Do you, do you suppose things could really change and uh, be balanced? I mean, that there could be a balance between improvisation and composition in the and I mean, in the public reception of it, in the common reception of it. Well, there's never going to be any balance between what we earn <laughs> and, what the, and what the opera earns. So there's a, yeah. that won't ever change. I used to think, it, you know, when I was a child, that things, you could change things through music. But no, I mean, power and culture and balance and how the perception of, of uh, fixed forms and people going endlessly to Puccini and stuff, is this is not going to change. Um, 
But what is interesting in your question is, and we actually were speaking a bit earlier about it, is like improvisation has become a thing. Like when I was in, 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 the, in certainly in the 70s, when I did play some jazz, um, people didn't speak about improvisation. They took solos. Mm -hmm. Nobody talked about it. They didn't want, if I used the word, they didn't know what I was talking about. And now, improvisation, everybody knows what it is. I mean, pretty well, like, anybody who's studying music knows what this word, or they, or they, or they have a view about what it may mean. This is a complete transformation, certainly in my professional lifetime. So in that respect, things have changed. And quite, you know, it's been a slow path, but it's been a, a, a very strong and clear change. And now most people who study <coughs> classical music, well, my daughter, she has a Russian teacher and she plays classical music, you know, very well. Even she knows what improvisation is, you know. <laughs> and I go by that, you know. So like well, it's changed. It's, no, I don't think so. No, because she avoided everything. I mean, I, and rightly so. I wanted her to have a career. I said, don't, don't ever listen to your father. Don't ever even listen to his music because I want you to have a career. And she did listen but, but to a few things. But even, but, you know, it's even, even with very strict training, this has crept in. And that, that's a transformation. I, it will never be a balance, I don't think, in terms of, Western culture, let's call it, because um, Western culture is, is, is empire building, it grabs things, you know. Like, I remember when I first went to New York, there were three gamelan orchestras just in downtown, you know, and, and non Indonesian among them, you know. So, like, we, we grab whatever we want because we're the dominant culture, but, um, but things have changed. Yeah, so there are a couple of things I would add to that maybe without disagreeing with anything that, that John has said um, and um, where to start um, well firstly when I listen to music myself um, if I'm really engaged in listening and I'm, if I'm really engaged in the way that the music is evolving or not or whatever it's doing um, I'm not thinking to myself whether this music has been written down or whether it's been programmed in a computer or whether it's been improvised. I don't think that should be important. Um, and so, yeah, from, from the point of view of a listener who is, to my mind, the, um, at least as important as any other um, uh, kind of musical activity is listening, um, it really doesn't matter whether something has been improvised or not. So that's, that's one possible way of looking at the answer. Another one, another way of looking at the, the question, I mean, um, relates to what, uh, what John was saying about the changes that have happened within our lifetimes. And I think if you look at um, the history of um, experimental music in the 20th century, whether it involves improvisation or any other means of composition, um, you have a huge expansion of what can be considered to be a musical sound until you get to the point where there is no sound which in and of itself um, cannot possibly be a musical sound. There are some sounds we might not want to hear in music, but um, we've got to the point where any sound can be accepted as a musical sound. So that, um, that um, direction in which music can spread itself out into new areas is basically closed off. I'm not saying that all of the possible musical sounds have been made, but we can imagine a situation where, all, where any sound could be incorporated into music. And I think what changes in the 21st century um, in particular is that we um, <clears throat> take the emphasis away slightly from what sounds are being made and put the emphasis a little bit more on how the sounds are being made. Um, that is to say, how we create music. And this is where improvisation becomes important because you know, there is an ethical dimension to improvisation too in being a non-hierarchical means of, uh, of musical creation, um, which can provide a model for a kind of society which is more um, egalitarian than the ones which we, which we live in presently. And I think that's, that's an important function 
that um, experimental musicians can have, which is to, to show that the imagination, our, our creative imagination, is not actually um, restricted by the kind of social constraints that restrict almost everything else we do. And I think that there, there, there can be, there should be something inspiring about that. Um, and one more thing on, on, that, on that front, improvisation, of course, is to a great extent about um, a, a, the establishment of means of communication, a means of sympathetic contact between people, between the performers, between the performers and the audience. And I think this should become increasingly important at a time when, you know, a lot of the things that we see, a lot of the things that we hear, um, the generation of images and texts through artificial intelligence is very much in the news at the moment. Um, and, yeah, we, we can't and we shouldn't hold back progress on, on the one hand, but one thing that we can do, which machines can't do, is we can create these avenues of human sympathy and communication within a musical context. And we might be able to make, of course, machines that can improvise, but in a way that defeats the object of improvisation in the first place. Um, because it really is about what it does to the people who are, what it does with the people who are um, participating in it as performers and as listeners. And um, if you take the, the human aspect out of that, then it seems to me you're not left with anything, not left with anything useful, with not anything meaningful. I would say it's not just human we're talking about now. Either. No, okay, no, you're, you're absolutely talk, right. It's like music now, is, is the notion of music as, as purely human exceptionalism has been uh, turned on its head, and my wife actually is busy with that very thing, with her, the, her uh, research into birdsong. So um, we might not even own the idea of music, let alone... Um, what you've just said, which I also don't, we don't disagree actually. On no, that. <laughs> but you know, music came from somewhere. I mean, there was music before there were people also. Well, exactly. The bird my wife studies has been on the planet for 13 million years. So um, we're rather new on the game. Um, I have a question for John, if I may. Um, what, in your mind, what makes a violin a violin? And when is a violin not a violin? Because you have this wonderful catalogue of extraordinary contraptions that you've made, and it seems like it's very important to you that they are all classified as violins. So what, for you, is the, the meaning and the significance of that taxonomy and that kind of lineage that you claim for all the instruments that you make, even when they are powered by human and non-human forces and means. Okay, I'll I try to be brief. Um, between the age of 15, when I gave up the violin, all right, and the age of 25, I, I guess I was a polymat. I was very good at many things, but they were all pretty useless, to what, as it turned out, whatever I tried. And, but I kept coming back to the violin. What is it, this thing that's, that's sort of here? And then... Um, at the age of 25, I suddenly, it all just, like a, you know, those magic moments, it just encapsulated. And I realized what I was going to do was make the violin central to everything I do. It sounds like a very simple idea, and I won't use, I will use the German word, but Gesamtkunstwerk, because I don't want to go Wagner, but, you know, but like... In my mean, it's something else. It means everything imaginable on, with, and about the violin that I can possibly conjure up or have the, 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 the skill or the willpower or the resources to do. So violin became something I'd always would return to, but by having this central focus in my life, I could go as far out as I wanted to go and still find my way home. Whereas between, before this time, I would find my way going far out, but have no idea how to get home and, but, and waste my time. So the violin always remains central. I'm still playing it, you know. And, um, and I'm playing it as it is, with just four strings, despite the fact I've done all these instruments with 19 strings and all kinds of things. I mean, I'm, 
if anybody's interested they don't want to waste two weeks of their life, they can go on my website and find out. Um, but now, for me, violin not only means violin, the icon that we know as, you know, this incredibly expensive Italian idea, um, but it also means for me a generic string instrument. And I realize I'm the only one who thinks that <laughs> and who acts on it. But that's why, in my head, it remains linked to this. So even, even if I go to my most extreme extensions of the idea, like I have, some of you might, be, might know, I have this Playing Fences project, um, which I've done all around the world, but it, mainly in Australia. It started in Australia. And the idea that, well, strings on a violin, why are they so ridiculously short? Let's just make them longer. So I started to build longer and longer necks on longer and longer instruments. And then that wasn't long enough, so it started to fill a gallery. And then I was out in the outback in Australia, and I thought, shit, the whole place is covered with strings, fences. Like, and the longest is 4,500 miles, it's, uh, yeah, 5,600 oh, 5, kilometers long. Yeah, it's the longest string instrument in the world. And all we've got to do is get out there and play it, which is an absurd idea, which I've never been able to persuade many people to do. But, um, but at the same time, I was violinist. I used a violin bow. And so, and, it, and I had no problem doing that. I could, next week I'm playing a violin concert. So I hope that answers it. <laughs> Any more questions or remarks? If not, then I would simply say thank you very much, John and Richard, for, for accepting my invitation and for telling us so much about your work and everything. Uh, it was really fascinating to listen to you. Thank you for the invite.
Thank you, Kalapani, for playing, for coming. Thank you, Richard and John, for your lectures. I would just like to mention on the 23rd of April, there will be the final performance here at this venue and in the Zawati Höfe. We will have Michel Doneda and Le Quandin together with the dancer on the beach. And there will also be some drinks and some food and some, a lot of talk. And uh, you are invited to come and celebrate the last performance here at Explore Bodo. Uh, on the 23rd of April. Thanks so much for coming. <coughs> Thank <laughs> you.